Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Madhav Rajan. I'm the uh, Dean and the George Schultz Professor of Accounting at Chicago Booth. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. This is a very, very special event. I'm delighted that you could be here as we welcome Booth alum Eric Leacher to our Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, the reason I'm sitting where I am is I'm at the Gleacher Center and, and you can see the, uh, the bridge behind me and the, the cars going by. This is, a, this is an amazing building and a, one of the great things Eric has done for the school. Um, so the Distinguished Speaker Series, this is a long-standing booth tradition. We bring in high-profile leaders from business, from the government, from the community to the school to share with, uh, with all of you their insights and experience. So we moved last spring when the pandemic hit to a virtual format. Uh, and it was really well received by you know, students, alumni across the globe. We had great chats back uh, last spring uh, with, with people talking really about COVID and its impact on their companies. People like Jenny Scanlon, uh, Tom Ricketts of the Cubs, uh, Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft and, and many others. And then we resumed the series again virtually last fall and, and sort of ran through the whole year. Uh, we have great guests like uh, Dave McLennan from Cargill, JP Gan from Inns Capital in Shanghai, and Mukherjee uh, from Puerto Rico, North America, and so on. Um, and this is our first Distinguished Speaker Series event of, uh, of this academic year, and there is honestly uh, no one better to be our leadoff hitter, if you will. Uh, Eric Gleacher is currently president of his family foundation, uh, the Eric Gleacher Foundation, uh, prior to that, he stepped down as chairman of the uh, investment bank Gleacher and Company in 2013. Before that, he was chairman of the predecessor firm Gleacher Partners, which he founded in 1990. Uh, prior to find, founding his own firm, uh, Eric headed uh, global M&A at uh, Morgan Stanley, and before that, spent 16 years with Lehman Brothers, where he founded the M&A business. Uh, he served in the U.S. Marine Corps before attending Chicago Booth. Uh, Eric is a life trustee of Northwestern University, from which he earned a BA in 1962. Uh, he's a member of the uh, U Chicago New York Roundtable and uh, has served as a trustee of the University of Chicago, a member of the Booth Council, uh, campaign co-chair for Chicago Booth, and a member of the Social Sciences Division Council. Thank you very much, Eric, for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so uh, to the audience, you know, I know many of you submitted questions in advance. So I'm going to start with those, but please uh, feel free to send in questions through Q&A. Uh, we'll have dedicated time at the end, but I'd also like to try to intersperse them with some of the topics that we're looking at. So please feel free to put stuff into Q&A and I'll, and I'll look at that. Um, so Eric, let me first start by congratulating you on uh, the publication of your memoir, Risk, Reward, Repeat, How I Succeeded and You Can Too. Uh, writing a book is of course an incredibly uh, huge undertaking what motivated you to write this and uh, could you explain the, why you chose the title that you did? Well, there were three things that I had in mind about writing a book and uh, I procrastinated for quite a while. I find that I'm very good at that like most people. But uh, when the uh, lockdown occurred uh, early in 2020, it was obvious that it was now or never if I was going to do this. and. Uh, so I did it, and uh, I, I enjoyed doing it very much. But what I had in mind goes like this. I gave, I have given uh, uh, lots of talks at business schools and in other places about business, about M&A, um, about people's careers. And there, there are two questions that came up quite often. One question people, want, people asked me was, how did I become good at M&A? Uh, the other one was, what do they have to do to succeed? Now, the, the latter question, everybody's interested in that. The former question, people in business school could be interested because M&A is a, is a large subject. Uh, but to try to answer those questions in front of large gatherings turns quite rapidly into cliche. It's just impossible. And I thought that I would, like to, I would like to answer those questions. And the way to do it was through the, the narrative of a memoir, a story. And so what this book does is it answers those two questions. So if you read the book, you'll find out what I did, the decisions I made, and what I learned along the way. And you can evaluate uh, whether you want to work as hard as I did if you want to succeed. Succeeding sounds good to everybody until you find out what it takes. Uh, 
But anyway, that was one. Number two was uh, the, the, the uh, time that I was at Morgan Stanley where I ran the global M&A business and global real estate was a very interesting time. It, 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 it was uh, most of the 1980s. And the last half of the 1980s is a period I call the Milken era. And it was a fellow named Mike Milken. And if you don't know who he is, you ought to Google him. Uh, and he really uh, transformed the high yield bond market into something that it, that it wasn't before. And uh, one of the things that he did uh, is he used it to initiate uh, takeover bids for the largest companies in the economy of the United States. And it was a real shock to the system and it changed things forever. And uh, it's a period that a lot has been written about but it's mainly about the personalities and the books are interesting, they're gossipy but nobody has really been on the inside and written what it was like to be in the middle of these deals and what was going on in the companies and their famous names, you know, Gillette, Union Carbide, RJR Nabisco, Texaco, Revlon. And so if you're interested in things like that, and I think particularly if you're a business school student, you should be, reading those pages will, will give you a feel for what really high pressure M&A is all about. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, is valuable to be exposed to. The third thing was uh, I left Morgan Stanley because I wanted to see what I could do on my own. And I started a boutique investment bank, one of the first ones. And that's another thing I think that business school students, students should read about because now going into finance as many will, the, the, the world has shrunk on Wall Street. You know, you have Morgan Stanley, you have Goldman Sachs, uh, you have JP Morgan, those are the three kings of the street. But beyond that, uh, the situation has changed. The foreign commercial banks, or, which are universal banks, are not as strong as they used to be. And now there are quite a few boutique investment banks uh, and so it's a real option for people in business school going into finance. You don't necessarily have to go to a bank or whatever. You might want to go to a boutique. And if you read the book, you'll see what happened to me when I started my firm and how we progressed. And uh, I don't think you'll find that written anywhere else. So those are, that, that kind of motivated me to write the book. So maybe uh, let me go back and sort of uh, track through your career, Eric. So as I mentioned, before you came to Booth, you graduated from Northwestern and then enlisted in the Marines. Uh, and you've been an incredible supporter of uh, veterans at, at, at Booth, which we can talk about a bit. Just tell us about your service and sort of how that's affected your life and career going forward. Well, it, it had a major effect on my life because um, I had a, a very nomadic upbringing uh, my father was in the Second World War, and when he came back, uh, he was a construction engineer. He was with the Seabees in the Pacific, building the airfields so that the bombers could go to Japan and come back without refueling. And when he came back, uh, we moved around a lot, and I went to 10 different schools. And I really, had, I really didn't have much of a self-image, uh, even going through college. Uh, I, I was a, a championship golfer, and that was the extent of my uh, self-image and ego. But beyond that, there wasn't much. So uh, I made a decision to go in the Marine Corps. Uh, there was a draft back then. So when you finished your student deferment, you had to, you had to have, at least have two years of military service in the Army. That didn't appeal to me. I figured if I was going to invest that, that amount of time, and it sounds like a lot of time when you're 22, 10% of your life, I figured I would do something more worthwhile and challenging. And so I picked the Marine Corps. And that turned out to be a great decision because it was, it was very challenging. This, the, the first day that uh, we arrived at Quantico, they immediately announced to the 320 officer candidates who were there, my, myself being one of them, uh, that only half would, would be commissioned, that 50% would, would be uh, removed from the program. So that was kind of a shock to the system. Uh, but then getting through that and then spending uh, six more months in uh, officer's basic school, you get assigned to your job in effect. And so the, 
the, the classic, the elite uh, uh, billet, they call it in the Marine Corps, is to be a platoon commander in the infantry. And uh, so I was, I, I achieved that, I was selected for that. And uh, that, that posed a whole different set of problems. Uh, you've got 45 men who are highly trained. You've got a, a 35 or 38 year old platoon sergeant who's highly experienced. And all of a sudden, one day you're in charge and uh, you're not prepared for it. So you have to figure it out and you have to figure it out quickly. And I did, and I learned a lot. And uh, it shaped me for the rest of my life. It shaped the way I worked. It shaped what I believed in. And I think it shaped uh, the title of my book, which is called Risk, Reward, Repeat. And, and the title means risk. If you want to do something significant in your lives, you're going to take risks somewhere along the line. There's all kinds of risk. Uh, my belief is you reward those who help you. And that philanthropy hopefully will create initiative with the people that follow you and who benefited from your philanthropy to repeat what you've done. And for example, and I do wanna talk about the, uh, the military, the veteran scholarship program we have at Booth. But uh, for example, I hope some of the recipients of the scholarship money that we have provided uh, when they're successful, and there will be some of them who are very successful and will supersede everything that I and others have done, I hope that they repeat and offer the same opportunities to others. And that's, that's the title of the book. That's wonderful. Um, let's talk a little bit about Booth in the 60s, Eric. So the, what were you hoping to gain from business school and what do you remember from your experience at uh, Chicago GSP? I was hoping to gain the ability to find a job. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. That was a serious answer to your question. Uh, so far, uh, at that point in my life, uh, I was uh, 26, and I had uh, a pregnant wife who had a, my oldest son at the Lying In Hospital. But I was 26, and all I had done was play golf uh, very successfully. I got a college degree and I worked for the military for three and a half years, but I had no knowledge of business. There was never a discussion of business in my family. My father was a construction engineer, which is a civil engineer without a college degree. And so I literally didn't know anything about business. And, but I knew that if you had an MBA from a good school that gave you an edge, so that was one thing I thought I needed. But the second thing was, what was I going to do? How was I ever going to focus myself and decide what to do? Because literally, I was a whiteboard. I was a, I was a blank screen. And uh, fortunately, I got into the University of Chicago. Um, and I was able to start not much more than a week after I was uh, discharged from the Marine Corps. And I was in a hurry by that time because I thought I was old and the world was passing me by, which is very humorous now when I look back at it. But that's why I came to Booth. And boy, I was not disappointed. It was a fantastic experience for me. Yeah, what do you remember from the experience? Sort of any, any faculty you remember or students you're, you're still in touch with to this day, Eric? Well, the first thing I remember is a guy named Hudson Thornburg, who was a an economics PhD candidate, and he taught calculus. And uh, I was not very good at calculus. Uh, I had not taken math seriously uh, when I was in high school. I took no math when I was in Northwestern because I was there playing golf and doing other things. And so I had to, I had to get smart very quickly. And he was this big, good looking guy, had blonde hair down to his shoulders. And he said, what, are you an idiot? You were, you were in the Marine Corps believing the Vietnam War was something that we should be doing? That's the way we started off. Well, we became great friends. And uh, I hired Hod as a consultant on numerous time, times at Lehman Brothers. But uh, that gives you, and I, and I was shocked. The University of Chicago, there were demonstrations all the time. 
I uh, remember one name, it was a woman named Bettina Apthecker. She was very famous. She was here demonstrating against the war. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of missed all that because uh, if you're serving in the Marine Corps, uh, you're believing, you know, you're going up the hill. And so this was all kind of shocked me. It may sound humorous, but uh, it's true. But the great things about it uh, were I, I took the first classes that Gene Fama and Merton Miller taught in their theory of finance course. And at the time it was 431 and 432. I don't know what the nomenclature is now. But by that time, I became reasonably, reasonably proficient in calculus and I aced the course. And those two fellows were the, as brilliant as anybody you're going to meet. Both of them were our, our Nobel Prize winners. But beyond that, they were great lecturers. And uh, I remember auditing Milton Friedman. I didn't take any of his courses, but he was teaching right, right next door to the old business school building. And he was another one that mesmerized you listening to him. And uh, so I remember things like that. I remember uh, those days, you, I think there were 12 required courses, which is probably very different from the curriculum now. And uh, I think a lot of those uh, I could have missed, but that's just the way it was. And you, you, know, you had to take them. But there were a lot of great courses. And I remember uh, the first term I was there, I took financial accounting, and it was in the summer quarter. Um, you could start then. I don't think you can do that anymore. And the professor was a guest professor from Tulane, and he was a star. He was another great talker, which is not always the case with accounting professors. But anyway, he called me up to class. Up, uh, he called me up uh, to the front of the room after one of the classes, after about three or four weeks, and he said, uh, "He said you asked the best questions of anybody in this class." And he said, "I wanted you to know that." And boy, that made my day because I want to tell you that I was nervous. I had, you know, I thought uh, I had never been a very serious student, and the University of Chicago is kind of the top of the of the pyramid and uh, I was worried if I was going to be able to do well or even survive. So this was illuminating for me. So wouldn't you know that on the midterm, he rephrased one of the questions I had asked in class. However, I was so nervous that I misinterpreted the question and I got a zero on it and I got a D on the exam. So I remember that. And then I remember the last thing I remember is a guy named Bob McCormick. And I'm sure you all know him because he's been a very uh, great guy as far as the school is concerned. He and I started uh, on the same day and he was a naval officer and he was married and his wife was also having a baby. And of course we kind of connected and he's the one that told me about investment banking. Because back in those days, the investment banks didn't uh, recruit at Chicago, and there was nothing in the curriculum about investment banking. The, the one investment course was called uh, Research Analysis or something like that. That's not the name of it. But it was taught by a guy named Marshall Ketchum. And uh, you can imagine what his nickname was, the sheriff. And he taught the course, but it was all about doing research. It was how, how would you do a research piece on a company? So there's nothing about investment banking. So I put that all together and I decided that uh, finance was what clicked for me. Mm -hmm. It involved the markets, which fascinated me, and it involved dealing with people, investment banking did. And I felt that I was capable of being pretty decent with people and smart enough to do the work and uh, off I went. So if uh, the banks didn't recruit at uh, Chicago, Eric, how did you get the job at Lehman? What was the story behind that? Well, when the, the summer that I, uh, after the summer I started, there was a month break, like there still is, I think. Things are dead in most of September until you start up right around now. Yep. And so I, uh, I worked, I had a job, but the job ended in, uh, uh, I called up a buddy of mine who I hadn't seen since I had gone into service, and he was the assistant golf pro at the Glenview Club, which is a pretty ritzy place. And he said, oh, it's totally dead out here. Come on out and we'll play. So we played the back nine first for some reason, came around, and there was a man 
on the first tee with a with a young boy turned out to be his 12 year old son. And uh, he said, well, let's join up and play together. So we did. We played the front nine and he was a very nice man. He asked me lots of questions about about me. And uh, at the end, he pulled out a business card and gave it to me. And he said, he said, I want you to call me if you'd ever be interested in a job. And we left and I went home and I pulled the card out and it said Donald Perkins, chairman of the board, Jewel Food Stores Companies or something like that. It was the Jewel Companies. Mm -hmm. And of course, my thought, I'd already been to business school one term. I said, well, I didn't come to business school to go work at a supermarket. That's how unsophisticated I was. But eventually I called him that winter when I realized what a great company it was. It was at the time, certainly one of the premier places that people at the GSB as it was called then wanted to work. Um, remarkably, he remembered me and gave me a job and they offered me a great full-time job, but, but I, was, I decided to go to New York and try to be an investment banker. And he said, well, we hate, we hate, we hate to, to lose you, but uh, I understand. And he said, we have two investment bankers on our board. Now, I didn't, I did, at that time, I will confess, I, I didn't really know what a board of directors was. Certainly never looked at the jewel board of directors. I wouldn't have known where to look at. So he said, uh, we have one from Goldman Sachs, Stan Miller, and we have Steve DeBrule from Lehman Brothers. So they're both good, but we really like Steve DeBrule. He helps us figure out our business. Would you like to meet him? That's how I got to Lehman. That's awesome. Um, and what prompted you to set up a specialized m and group at Lehman? Well, that was a good move that I made. Uh, that, was, that was a real risk. Uh, the reason was, is I got interested in M&A and in, in those days, it was mainly uh, selling private companies, selling a family company where there was no successor, pretty mundane things like that. And, and Goldman Sachs did the same thing. And, uh, but I got interested in that. Uh, I, it, it was more interesting to me to work with chief executives and help them figure out their business and help them buy businesses and sell businesses than it was to advise big companies about their financing. And I was doing a lot of that with Caterpillar Tractor and General Foods. I had probably the premier set of Lehman accounts. I got to be a partner in five years, which was very quick. And I had a lot of the big accounts, but I, I just thought, that dealing with companies and advising them was more interesting for me. And around that time, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley had set up the first organized M&A departments on Wall Street. And I saw a real problem for Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was a purposely unorganized place and it was kind of each man to himself. There was no teamwork culture. And I felt that with, with Goldman and Morgan specializing that we were gonna start losing our clients uh, because the clients are smart and they're gonna say, well, I wanna to go to this group that does, no, that does nothing but M&A and why should I work with Eric? Cause he's advising on bond deals and this. So uh, I went uh, to see, um, a guy named Marty Lipton. And uh, there were two of the most, the two most prominent m &A lawyers in the world at that time were Joe Flom, who started and built up Skadden Arps from scratch, and Marty Lipton, who did the same thing with Wachtell Lipton. And for those of you who don't know, Google them. They are two of the greatest law firms in the world that these guys started for various reasons on their own. And I had met Marty once somewhere, but he didn't know me. And so I went, I went to see him and I told him just what I told you, exactly the same. And I said, Lehman's gonna have a problem. And I said, I know how to fix that problem, but I don't know, I don't know about M&A. Will you teach me? And surprisingly, he said, absolutely. He said, why don't you start coming to my office at nine o'clock every Saturday morning 
and we'll work on m a and i did and uh it was it was marty and his wife at the time uh erica steinberger who was a superstar m a lawyer and the two of them taught me the business from top to bottom and uh i managed to convince the two decision makers at Lehman to let me give up all my accounts and start an M&A department. And my buddies at Lehman thought I was nuts. They said, you'll never make this work. Your people aren't gonna come to you. They're gonna want the fees from the M&A business because they're gonna want to maximize their bonuses. And I said, well, I said, I'm gonna do it. And I, I, th I said, when it starts working, people will come. And fortunately, that's what happened. And within a few years, we were right up there with Goldman and Morgan Stanley and on where we go. So uh, we had a comment that somebody submitted, Eric. It said, it was not a question. He said, thank you for interviewing on the Chicago campus in 1974 as a partner of Lehman Brothers. It changed the course of my life and inspired my loyalty to the University of Chicago. So. Uh, well, whoever that is, I th thank you for the comment. That's great, and uh, I hope you've had a sensational career. And I'm I'm really pleased that you're loyal to the university. Uh, I want to also encourage the audience if send in questions through uh, Q and A, the Q and A box. Um, so uh, there was a question about you know leaving Lehman to join Morgan Stanley, and why did you do that, and how did you find that the two firms were very different or not? Well, I was at Lehman for almost 16 years, about half, as you said, and uh, I got tired of the, the, the culture. Um, and uh, I just said, I want to do something different. Uh, and I knew the top people at Morgan Stanley, and I decided that the, if they were interested in me, that I would go there. And uh, they were. And I went there and it was a fantastic experience. It was the opposite of leaving. It was all teamwork. It was a totally team culture, almost too much so. It was, too, it was almost too homogeneous. Everyone wore the same frames on, on their glasses. And uh, so many of the young guys wore suspenders because Bob Greenhill, who was a tremendous uh, charismatic leader, wore suspenders. So there was a lot of that. So it was actually good. I was the third person ever to come in from the outside as a partner at Morgan Stanley. And uh, I was different. And I learned one, one of the things, one of the many things I learned in the Marine Corps is you have to be yourself. You know, flawless integrity, being yourself, pursuit of excellence. Those are the things that guided me. And I wasn't going to change because I was at Morgan Stanley, and I didn't. And I think it was good for them because within a, within a two or three months, they put me as, in as head of M&A, and we did a lot of things differently than they had done them before, and they were extremely successful throughout uh, uh, the entire time I was there. So you had huge success at Morgan Stanley, as you mentioned. You were in the management committee that ran the firm. What made you decide to give that up and start your own company? Simply that it was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to see if I could do it myself. And it, it's, it sounds simplistic to people, but uh, as I progressed over the years, if I felt that I wanted to do something like, I would have been so comfortable taking that job at Jewel but I went to New York, really didn't know anybody on, in New York, couldn't afford to live in Manhattan at first, lived on Staten Island. But I knew that if I had something I wanted to do and if I didn't do it, that I would keep thinking about it. I'd wake up in the middle of the night dissecting it. And so I knew you know, that I wanted to try this. Uh, I was jealous of my friend, Bruce, Bruce Wasserstein, who had left first Boston and set up his firm. And he asked me to come and join him. And he said, come on, come with us, come with Joe Perella and me, we'll change the name and all the superstars will be in one place. And I felt, I said, well, you know, I said to myself, I, I, I like Bruce a lot. 
But if I was going to do this, I was going to do it on my own. So I'm, I'm afraid for better or for worse. That's the kind of person I am. I wanted to do it. Uh, I told my wife, I said, uh, my income is probably going to go down to 25% of what it is now. She said, so what? If you're going to do it, she said, I'm tired of talking about it. She said, either do it or don't do it. So I did it and uh, never looked back. And uh, as I mentioned before, that's kind of the third part of the book. If you want to read what that was like and learn a little, about, a little bit about boutique investment banking and what it's like to start your own business, you might enjoy it. So one of the questions that uh, came in just now, Eric, is what was there a market gap that you saw that inspired you to, to start Bleacher Partners? No, not in those days. It was just a question of doing, setting up a business on my own, seeing how well I could do, you know, to develop the business and running my own business, which, which I did for almost 25 years after that. But the, I didn't see the market gap. Now, the, now I see a real market for it because mm -hmm. you only have the, the three big investment banks. You've got Morgan, Goldman, and JP Morgan uh, and Citicorp provides money, but you need somebody independent of the money provider. And on the big deals, whether they're, and most of the deals now are negotiated deals. You know, back in the 80s, the reason I think uh, it's interesting is that they were takeovers. And, uh, uh, and now they're, they're negotiated deals and the, and the big banks uh, provide the money. Back in the 80s, the investment banks didn't have the money. They were not providing the money. They were just providing the advice. And so if I were a CEO doing something significant, I certainly would want an independent financial advisor who's not getting a huge, huge fee for putting up the money to give me his opinion, his or her opinion of what's going on. So I think there's, there's a real niche for the boutiques and a, and, a, and a real employment opportunity for many people in business school. We found that uh, we, our big source of, of people uh, was Penn, was the Wharton School. Mm -hmm. uh, for, first of all, it's a good school and uh, uh, they're trained. And uh, we had many, many come from the Wharton School and most of them uh, became hedge fund managers. Almost none went to the large investment banks once they were done with two or three years with us. So we have a couple of questions asking about your career. So one question is, uh, how did you deal with career downs and the need to reinvent yourself? Everybody has downs. So I, I've had my share. And I found that I was really good at looking forward. And that's sometimes hard to do. If you have a down, you figure out why. Did you make a mistake? If you made a mistake, don't make it again. But don't dwell on it. You know, look forward. Going forward is what counts. You can you can agonize over uh, you know a bad bounce or a shortcoming, but it doesn't do you any good for the future. You know, you got to look ahead. Uh, just maybe related, but I'll maybe tangentially. What was the most pivotal point in your career, and how did you come to that decision? The most pivotal point, yeah, I think the most pivotal point easily is the decision to leave Morgan Stanley. I mean, I had a pat hand there. I had, I had the most successful and profitable business in the place. I was really good at it. I could have stayed indefinitely. I wasn't interested in management. I loved it. I loved the m and I loved what I did, but leaving was a big risk. Uh, and uh, I had made enough money then so that I, you know, I wasn't gonna go bankrupt or anything, but I was, I was still pretty young and uh, it's pretty hard to walk out of a place like Morgan Stanley on the street one day in January and, you know, say, well, okay, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. um question uh, says, what advice would you give to somebody who's in their 50s having mid-career problems in an investment career? Figure out something new to do because your 50s is still young. And if you've got the education 
you've got human capital. And uh, I don't know if we're going to take it up, but I was thinking about things uh, that I have done at the University of Chicago. And I was invited to give the commencement address one time. I didn't, and I didn't bother to look up when, but it had to be around the, the turn of the century, 1999 or somewhere around there. And uh, the subject, and I, and I remember it because it's the most nervous I think I've ever been. You know, there were enormous numbers of people. They had the jumbotron screen outside. The Rockefeller Chapel was loaded. And uh, I'm comfortable talking without notes on a subject, but the commencement address was too important. And I wrote it, and I wrote it, and I edited it, and I read it. And at the, at, when I was finished, I was di really disappointed. I, I felt that I had been very dull. And so after the speech, there were you know, hundreds of people milling around. This guy comes up to me, and, it's, and I recognize him. It was Gary Becker. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Gary Becker, you know, he's a superstar economist. It doesn't he have the Becker Friedman Center? Is that what it's called? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he, he won the Nobel Prize as well. For, uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 1992. So Gary Becker comes up to me, and I'm 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 really kind of bummed because I didn't think I did a very good job. And he says, Oh, he said, I loved your speech. He said, You talked about human capital. And he said, that's the most important thing. That's if all the things I think about that. So I, I gave his speech and I said to the I said to the class, I said, look, you've got you don't have to go to work for the insurance company or the bank or McKinsey. I said, the world is out there. I said, there's no country like the United States that's as innovative and has as many opportunities. And you, with your Chicago MA, you've got enough human capital to do whatever you want and don't be restrictive and so forth. And so looking forward, believe me, I never saw what it was going to be like now. But I just believed back then what I said, that you could do this in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had done it when I left Morgan Stanley, and it was tremendously rewarding. And, of course, now it's unbelievable. You know, the, 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 uh, the whole way of working has changed and, and innovation has changed and, and, uh, and companies are springing up all the time. When I watch the news... In the morning, once in a while, I've mostly companies I've never heard of before. You know, so it's an unbelievable thing. So my speech, even though I didn't do a good job, it was it was a precursor of things to come. And I would advise the students, like I said, to use that human capital and figure it out. There's lots to do. Uh, we have a question that said, how do you how did you handle difficult clients? What advice would you give to senior bankers on handling Difficult clients. I told difficult clients exactly where they stood, no matter what they wanted to hear. And if they were really difficult, I told them goodbye. And I mean by that, there were once in a while working with a company, uh, I was not comfortable. I wasn't comfortable with the chief financial officer or whatever. And life's too short, too many things to do. And I was resigned the situation. Uh, we had a question that says, you mentioned working hard throughout your career. Can you elaborate on what that means? It means, it means putting your work in front of other things that are even, you know, more dear to your life. It means being committed to making, to making it, a, to making work a success and doing whatever is required going wherever you have to go, being there, doing the job. It's very tough. It was, uh, I, there were, I, I had, I'm an only child. I never had any cousins, but I have six children, seven, including my wife's son, who I treat like a son, eight grandchildren. And as they were growing up, there were many vacations, which I couldn't go on, but, I put the commitment I had to Morgan Stanley or the people that worked for me at Gleacher and Company first. And so by working hard, that's the hardest part. It's not how many hours you work. 
it's it's the commitment and following through on it that's really tough. Uh, so maybe let me turn the topic back a, a bit and then we'll go back to some advice. So you obviously you, as I mentioned, I'm at the Gleacher Center. Uh, you're the person who made the, the downtown campus sort of uh, financially possible. What prompted that gift back in that day, uh, Eric? And uh, how do you think about it today? Well, back in the day, uh, the dean was Bob Hamada. Mm -hmm. And I was not particularly close to Bob. I took his, uh, um, his course called Money and Banking. It was a great course. He was a very good, he was a good professor. And I hope he was a good dean. But one thing the University of Chicago did with me is they stayed in touch with me almost from the time I left school. Um, I'm not sure why, but they did. And they would, uh, when people were in New York, they would call up and they want to stop by and say hello. Or as time went on, the deans wanted to have lunch. So I knew all the deans. And Bob Amata came by one day and he told me about the building. And Jack Gould is, is a, certainly the, 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 who, was, who was also a dean. And, and I took um, macroeconomics from him as a student. He gets the credit for envisioning the building and what it would mean to the university. Because the university had nothing in Chicago. They had a, what I call a sliver, bill, a sliver building, you know, a skinny, Mm -hmm. A 190 Delaware place where the evening sessions were taught. It was an embarrassment. <laughs> I actually had a job there advising students. And uh, so Jack Gould was the guy with the idea to get the building done. And he somehow got it, got it started while he was the dean. And so Bob Hamada came by and said, would you put up $15 million of equity you know, in the building that the university needs? And I called my daughter, my older daughter. She's got a good head on her, her shoulders because I wanted to see what my children would think about, you know, taking that much money. And she said, oh, she said, that would be, <clears throat> she said, that would be kick ass. Go do it. <laughs> and you know what? So I told Bob Hamada, I, we did it. And they did a challenge gift and they raised more money off the challenge. Uh, I don't know if they raised the full $15 million they were looking at, but I think they did. So it was a very successful gift. Uh, and I told Bob, I said, look, I said, you don't have to name the building for me. I said, I don't live in Chicago. And, you know, you can use it for somebody else. He said, no, no, you don't understand. If we don't name it for a business school alum, the university will take it and they'll name it. For somebody else, he said, we, we've got a name for you. So, and so you asked me how I feel about it now. I'm glad he said that because so many people have said things about the building and so forth. And, and believe it or not, most of them have seen it from the Chicago River Tour. Yes. Which is, I know, the most popular event uh, tourists do in Chicago. But I'm very proud of the building, very proud I did it. Uh, and I'm just proud of the fact that I have this association with the university and with the business school and really happy that I decided to get an MBA. So the uh, one thing I want to tell the audience is Eric has been a great uh, donor to the university, but beyond that, he is wonderful at speaking to others about giving to the university. And just in the past few years, uh, you know, Eric made a $10 million gift to underwrite scholarships for veterans. Uh, and then raised another 10 million from the uh, uh, Mike Harper, you know, the Harper Center, his family foundation. Um, the question is sort of what was, what was sort of the uh, impetus behind that, Eric? And sort of, and you've been an amazing advocate for veterans sort of more broadly. Maybe you could just speak about that. Well, so obviously I'm a veteran and I believe in this country, the veterans are, they don't get enough credit for what they do for us. And I know what it meant to me to be able to go to business school and I got the GI Bill, but uh, my wife has, had been a school teacher while I was in the Marines and we saved the money. And uh, 
at the end, I had to borrow money to move to New York. So we got through, but it was tough. And I had a fellowship after a while. I worked hard, I got good grades. And so my tuition, which, which was a big expense, was, was covered by what the university did for me. And so I, I will say this before I explain what happened. I, I, take, I take credit for starting the ball rolling with veterans. I certainly don't take credit from the university the business school and others who put together the program. But right now, or at least the last time I got the numbers, there were 99 US veterans at Booth in all the programs, 99. I don't think there's another university or school in this country. And I will tell you this, the university itself now has got 14 or 15 or maybe even 20 undergraduate veterans. And part of that, is because I talked to Bob Zimmer about the whole program a lot. And I think, I think that, you know, maybe it had some impact on these, on these programs. So I'm really proud of the veterans program here. And I, I, it costs a lot of money uh, to go and get an MBA. And these veterans are all in their high 20s or 30 years old. Most of them have wife, they have kids. To, to put the, the GI Bill provides a lot. There's, a, there's another program called the Yellow Ribbon Program. It provides money, but there's still a shortfall. And when you're a veteran, you're not making much money. And so it's hard for these, for these guys to, and gals to come. There are a lot of gals. And to, to give them um, the, the bridge between the money they get from the government and what they need to actually come here, uh, I think it's a great thing to give back to the veterans. And I'm sure that some of these veterans are gonna go out into the economy, into government uh, and be superstars. And hopefully some of them will give back to the university. So as far as I'm concerned, what my, maybe my most significant achievement in my personal es estimation is helping getting a ball ro rolling for these veterans programs. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you answered my next question, which is sort of, how do you think about measuring your life and, 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 and success? And what do you view as your biggest achievements to date? Well, I will tell you that when, that when, I, was, when I was fully immersed in the M&A, uh, and I said this in the book, that I had this private, I had this private uh, uh, challenge to myself. I wanted to be considered the top m a professional in the world. So that was important to me. But not, I never told people that. I never talked about that. But that, that was one of my goals. Uh, and I want to say that that, to me now, is insignificant compared to the philanthropic things that I've tried to do and the feedback I've gotten from others that I've helped. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's inspiring. It's, it's humbling, but I would say to me, to myself, that that's, that would be my greatest achievement. Um, one thing going back to the veteran scholarships, Eric, I think people would be interested in knowing your relationship with the Harper family. Well, Mike Harper, uh, I met him, he was working for Pillsbury and we, we did a little tiny uh, divestment for Pillsbury uh, of a, a, a ch broiler chicken production business that they had. We sold it to a company in England, which he was amazed about. But I had been, I had started working in Europe, talking to companies and we hit it off. And uh, he said he didn't get along with the new chairman of Pillsbury. And about six months later, he called me up and he said he was, uh, he was the CEO of ConAgra, which I'd never heard of. It was a tiny company. It was, by my standards, it was bankrupt. It had uh, 160 million of debt and a $10 million market value on the New York Stock Exchange. And it had lost $14 million in its most recent year. And uh, he said, well, I have, he said, I have some problems. He said, I need some investment banking help. And he wanted to sell their division in Puerto Rico, which was actually doing well. And so uh, he hired me. and. I said, Mike, I said, this company's in such bad shape. 
and it was 1973, I just became a partner at Lehman. I said, I can't take on business like this and do the work. My, my partners will think I'm a nut and uh, you know I can't do it. So he sent me a check for $25,000. <laughs> so I did it, sold the company, I had it all agreed. And he called up and he said, you know what? Uh, the whole business is doing better now and I don't want to sell it. He said, but I'm going to send you a check for $100,000 or whatever it was. He paid my whole fee as if we had sold the company. And from, there, from that point on, we built ConAgra up from that uh, standing start that I referenced to a company with a total market value when he retired of about $15 billion. And uh, he and I did countless deals. I did all the deals. Uh, and, uh, and he became my, one, my, one of my first clients after I set up my own firm. And uh, the University of Chicago named him as the alumni of the year. And they have a big banquet. I don't know if you still do it, Matt. But uh, we do. After COVID, we'll start again for the distinguished alumni it, awards. It's, a, it's huge. It was at the the Sheraton, which is right near the Glacier Center, I think. Right, isn't that the hotel right across the yeah. way? Thousand people attend. So here's Mike Harper, alumni of the year. He gave him a thousand dollars. That was his financial contribution. And I so I gave up on him. I we you know so I I just went silent. And one day, years later, I get a call from a guy who was uh, the development officer of the business school. And he said, I'm about to get a, a lot of money from Mike Harper. He said, I'm going down to Omaha to see him. I said, cancel your trip, save the airfare. You're, <laughs> you're wasting your time. Well, anyway, Mike gave $25 million. And uh, that's the Harper Center. That was the equity for the Harper Center. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, he said, believe me, he said, your gift influenced me. He said, I wanted to do something, but I wanted to wait till I got my family affairs all squared away and my family foundation set up and all that. And so between us, if you add up uh, all the money, all the professorships, all this and that, it's a very significant amount of money that, uh, all, be, that all evolved from a bankrupt company <laughs> in Omaha. That's a great so that's story. Business. That's, a, that's, a, that's a happy story. And we were <laughs> friends, you know, uh, for his entire life. Uh, we have a couple of other people asking for uh, advice. One is that if you were graduating today, would you choose to go to Wall Street as a career? Absolutely. I mean, if you like finance, uh, it's a great place to go. It changes rapidly, quickly. Uh, every few years, it's different. But uh, it'll go on forever, and it's a, it's the engine that helps, you know, develop and finance the economy. And uh, I think it's a, I think it's a great place to go. I think there are a lot of great places to go, depending on the personal characteristics of the individual in question. Uh, the other question was, what advice do you have for somebody who's just starting at Booth? Work hard and do the best you can do. You, that's, that's the payoff. If you come to Booth, and Booth is now very different. You know, when I was at Booth, there was no social life. There were five women at Booth. Three of them worked for the university. I don't know who the other two were. I don't think I ever saw them. Uh, the first thing you do now when you come to Booth, unless this has changed maybe because of COVID, is you, the people go take a trip to the Far East. They go to Thailand or Bali or some, I mean, this is new stuff. So, you know, you want to do that. You want to, you want to make relationships, but let me tell you, the payoff is by working hard, doing the best you can do, trying to maximize your performance, your grades and so forth and what you learn. And I believe that, the, that that will stand you in good stead forever. If you take that attitude. Uh, a question that just came in, what is your view about working with colleagues or co-workers who have questionable character? I wouldn't go near them. That's a, that is a reject. You hit the, you hit the reject button instantly. That's, that, that, I find that to be kind of a ridiculous question. How could you even ask it? When I, occasionally when I had somebody 
uh, with, with character problems, and there were a couple, they were gone. You know, you, you just can't afford it. Your reputation is, is everything. And whether you're working with them or near them or whatever, it's something that uh, you should uh, eliminate from your operation immediately. All right, I'm not gonna let you go without asking about, first of all, so you should tell people where you are right now. Oh, I'm in uh, Scotland. I'm in my home in Scotland where I spend three months a year. It's, uh, I got rid of my watch because I didn't want it to beep, but it must be, it, it's, uh, oh, it's three minutes till midnight here. But my friend here, Mr. Red Bull <laughs> is, is on the scene. So I, I hope I've, uh, I've conducted myself with alertness and acuity, but uh, anyway, I'm having a good time. My wife and I love it over here. Well, so I, I wanted that to be a lead into the last question, which is about golf, which has had a big role in your life. Could you speak about that and sort of what role it's played all the way through? Well, like I said, when I was a kid, uh, I was, I was a baseball player, but my father took me to play golf and, and we moved all the time and I could bring the golf with me and I couldn't bring the baseball team. And so I started playing and when I was 13, I won the first tournament I played in, I won the second tournament I played in. And so I was hooked. And uh, it probably is the reason I went to college. I played on a national championship team. Uh, when I decided I wanted to go to a top school that got me into Northwestern. I met Don Perkins, the story I told about mm -hmm. how I got my job at first at Jewel and then at Lehman. Uh, and I've met many people. Uh, I never, I couldn't do business golf with chief executives. However, after a while, if I was working with, with someone who we became friendly and they played golf, well, we always ended up playing golf and it, it, it helped consolidate the relationship. But it's been something that I've done well for my whole life. It would be like if you played the piano or you played chess or, you know, anything that you could do with excellence is worth doing in life, in my opinion. I don't care what it is. You name it. Uh, you know, running, riding a bicycle aggressively, whatever it is. So golf was, was the thing that I could always do and I still can do and I'm still motivated to keep trying to do it. Well, on that, uh, I wanted to thank you on behalf of the school for uh, your candor uh, and your great insights and for being so open and talking to the, to the students. And also, of course, for being such an amazing uh, alum and a donor and a supporter of the school and a mentor to the students. Uh, Eric, before COVID, would come every uh, year in November for the uh, around Veterans Day to do the, an amazing event. Uh, where he made me drink grog the last time. Uh, I'm sure you remember that. Uh, but, but thanks again, Eric, for being such a great friend and supporter of the school. And congratulations on an amazing career and a, and a great book that you have out now. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me. Uh, I always enjoy talking to you. You've got a, a great way and a, a sense of humor and so forth, which I enjoy immensely. And uh, um, I, 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 all the proceeds from this book I wrote goes to charity. So some of it, no doubt, will find its way back to Booth. So I, I highly recommend that the students read it because I do think there's a lot in there that will be helpful to, to most people. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. For Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.